I, I just reassure me, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Right, okay. Well, yeah, I was asked to choose a topic to speak about, and I clearly decided right from the beginning that this is the one I might need to bring my colleagues' attention to. You know, the Helicobacter pylori uh, in children for, you know, for different uh, uh, and, um, and uh, specific reason. Uh, the least is, uh, is, is actually the confusion among people uh, about how to deal with it. Uh, not just among, you know, general pediatricians and uh, family physicians and uh, pediatricians and other specialities, the confusion is actually still even there among pediatric gastroenterologists. And as an example here, yeah, we had uh, one time, some time ago, discussion between uh, the members of our uh, pediatric gastroenterology group uh, in, the, in the Emirates, and the way we treat it, the way we deal with it, is clearly different really out of this uh, WhatsApp uh, uh, discussion. In fact, out of this, we went on to actually look at it in an, in an official way. My colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Bita, Rana Bita, ran a, a quick survey among us. And really she found an interesting findings that uh, because there are certain published and agreed international guidelines as to how to deal with children with Helicobacter pylori uh, infestations and, and infections, and whether people actually do follow the guidelines or not, or, or follow some and, and may not be uh, the, the whole lot. The findings were quite interesting to us, really. It's only just about 50% of the pediatric gastroenterologists that they follow a clear, agreed guidelines. Others partially follow and carry on doing their, their, their own ways of dealing with it. So you can just imagine now how the confusion can be on the, on the, on the, on the side of uh, uh, the, the, the other colleagues. Is it a condition we need to be bothered about? Do we need to be concerned about? Yeah, one side of the answer, indeed, yes, we need to. Uh, you know, some people might argue for this, for a um, certain reason, you know, because of its association with, uh, an established association with chronic gastrites. Say, peptic ulcer disease, whether it is duodenal or whether it is gastric, no doubt. Uh, you know, 80 to 90 percent of it is actually associated with H. pylori infection. So, so it's, it's actually important to keep in mind, important to uh, uh, think about. But at the same time, then, the other side of argument, well, yeah, it's, it's very uh, common, it's very prevalent, yet it's, it, it's only 3 percent risk of uh, uh, peptic ulcer among those who has got the uh, actual infection. I think in, in, at this point, we try and make the distinction between, um, you know, having, having got peptic ulcer disease and its relationship with the infection. That's a strong relationship. Once the ulcer is there, 80 to 90, 95%, is, it's actually due to Helicobacter pylori infection. But if you have got the infection, not necessarily that you're going to get the ulcer. It's only in about like, a lifetime risk of only 3%. So different sides of the argument here. Not just that, it may even go beyond this. People say, well, it is the reason behind or it's main factor behind developing um, adenocarcinoma of the stomach. Indeed, it is that, uh, particularly in certain parts of the, uh, of the world for reasons which we might actually uh, uh, touch on uh, lately. Yeah, it is, it is actually uh, uh, carcinogenic, uh, no doubt, but may not be as, um, as much. And the cancer may not just be limited to the adenocarcinoma, the mortal lymphoma as well. Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the risk is there and it is certainly treatable with actually treating the, uh, the, the antibiotics, the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma is treatable, you know, with just eradicating the uh, H. pylori infection. Yeah, it is it's common, indeed very common, and I don't think there's any doubt about how common uh, it is really. Uh, and that is one of the uh, uh, confusing factors, and that is one of the difficulties here. It is very common. If you were to look for it, you will find it, no doubt. But my advice, my single takeaway message, do not look for it unless there is a strong necessary indication, really. Because if you were to look for it, you will find it. Say. If we start uh, with, with, with areas where it may not be as, as, um, as 
prevalent in in America, for example, among adults, less than fifty percent of them will be uh, will be um, um, infected. In South America, for example, in in uh, Brazil, um, the prevalence among uh, children increases with age. So 10% rise almost from 54 to 64 over eight years time. And just imagine the cumulative increase in this uh, percentage. Um, you know, by, uh, by, by five years, half of the kids will be affected towards adulthood. It, it's almost all of them will be actually infected. So, so it is time limited. As, as, as they grow older, they contract the infection. And it is felt to be that, that the disease is, is usually contracted during childhood. And I'll show you some figures to support that. For some reason, in other parts of the world, for example, even in developing areas, uh, the, there, is, there has been some improvement, like in Argentina, for example, there was a, there was a drop over uh, you know, just two, three years time from 40% to less than uh, one fifth or about one fifth of the uh, children. Now the picture on the Middle East side, the area which we work in and the area which uh, we are interested at and because of which we need really to adapt our thinking of the condition, the, the, the prevalence is very high. As uh, uh, one single figure to take away is three quarters of people are infected, three quarters of the adults. Almost 75% of adults in the Middle East are infected with H. pylori, okay? Um, and, and that is the case here, even uh, in the United Arab Emirates, it's about 75%, so it's very common. Some of the, so, some of the figures here, you know, variable, but I think the variety is, is, is because of the way uh, these studies were actually uh, 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 conducted, really. Uh, where we live here, that's as, as I said, 75% uh, uh, in North Africa, uh, you know, like, like that in uh, Argentina, you know, 50% when they are 10, uh, it goes up to 85% uh, towards um, adulthood. In Turkey, uh, uh, Dr. Bilevangalo there demonstrated quite clearly that, uh, you know, the risk of getting the infection increases with, uh, uh, with age. So it moves from about 18% at three years of age to more than 65% uh, beyond 10 years of age. So the older you get, the more likely that you'll be infected with the, uh, uh, with the uh, um, infection. And looking at um, the reasons behind that, you know, why it is common in certain areas, not in, not, not in others, of course, we, we have evidence that age plays a role. You know, the, the older you get, the more likely you will contract the, uh, the infection. But on top of that, the socioeconomic conditions, it is felt to be person to person, human to human transmission. So in areas where there is overcrowding, there is a, a lot of personal contacts, poor living conditions, poor sanitary conditions, poor toilet facilities, uh, poor housing conditions, the chances are actually higher to, uh, to uh, contract the infection. Now, with such prevalence of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of an infection, there is um, an uprising concern that whatever antibiotics used to be effective in the past, they're not actually effective anymore. So the efficiency of the uh, anti-H. pylori eradication regimes is getting less. That is because of the rise in the bacterial resistance to antibiotics. You know, we need to, uh, of course, you know, a common sense kind of thing. Uh, the, the, the bacteria become more resistant to antibiotics, and because of that, the, the, anti, the uh, eradication regimes are, are uh, less effective. So I'll take you uh, quickly through some, some of the figures. Metronidazole uh, resistant, primary resistance. Uh, yes, the resistance is of two types. Primary, that is before the actual bacteria is exposed to the antibiotics. And secondary, after being treated and um, it became resistant. So the resistance to antibiotic, the primary resistance has been really stable for the metronidazole. From the time people started looking at it till this, uh, till this uh, uh, time, it ranges between 20 to 40% resistant. With clarithromycin, initially again, you know, between uh, roughly uh, again um, at around 20, 25%. Clarithromycin, there is an important factor about clarithromycin, the resistance, for example, in the 1990s were about 10%, less than 10%. 
Now it moved up to about 25%. That is the primary resistance, let alone the secondary resistance, which is more common to clarathromycin and which is the major factor in the failure of those anti-H. pylori eradication regimes. So this is a more recent uh, report uh, 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 published just recently, about uh, uh, two years ago. Again, you know, see the, uh, the primary resistance is basically almost the same for the metronidazole. This is the metronidazole in adults in kids, 30 to 40%. Um, clarithromycin, 30 to 50% now. And the 90s used to be around 10%. Now, the other interesting fact is really, this is the amoxicillin. This is the amoxicillin, hardly any resistance to amoxicillin. So amoxicillin is a fundamental part of any uh, uh, therapy regime for uh, uh, um, H. pylori, an important, uh, an important fact. Again, um, another uh, 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 report from Vietnam uh, indicating that uh, you know the uh, the actual resistance to clarimacin is very high there, almost you know sort of uh, um, eighty percent compared to uh, the amoxicillin, which is almost again negligible. Now, the, the change over time is quite clearly seen as to, um, uh, based on the fact whether, whether uh, 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 based on the type of the regime, triple therapy against quadruple bismuth-based therapy. Uh, this, this plays a, uh, uh, a role. You may ask, you know, why H. pylori is treated with multiple antibiotics, not with just single antibiotics. The less number of antibiotics, the more likely the bacteria to become resistant. The less of the duration, the more likely not to be responsive. So here is, here is an evidence comparing the outcome, uh, you know, sort of five years apart from 2000, 2005 and 2006 to 2011. This is um, triple therapy, say PPI, amoxicillin and metronidazole or clarithromycin dropped in the efficacy of the regime dropped from 80 to 60% while the quadruple therapy based on uh, uh, bismuth has remained the same, around 80%. Uh, so, so the changes are more with the uh, lesser number of antibiotics and, and, and more with the uh, uh, triple therapy. Again, the changes here are, are manifested over time with the clarithromycin and levofloxacillin in particular, uh, sort of a significant change over time, just over uh, you know, a, 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 a scan of four or five years. Okay, it is common indeed, uh, but we do, we do know that uh, in most of the patients, most of the children, it is there, but it does, it does not cause any problem really. And, uh, and one important fact to consider, another important fact to consider is that it has got no role in the functional abdominal pain you see very commonly in your practice. So do not actually look at it unless there are specific uh, features which will point towards it, but do not examine for H. pylori in any child comes in with uh, abdominal pain. So because of this, really, you have to strike the balance. It's very common. If you were to look for it, you will find it. And then you find yourself needing to treat it. And then, you know, the difficulty of, of uh, sticking to the actual um, eradication regime, the, the, the cost with that as well. The development of uh, you know the side effects of the antibiotics versus well no do I need to treat it do I just reassure the balance do I just ignore it so you have to strike the balance really and uh, and uh, and because of this there has been recently a very clear recommendation that you know in investigating a child with the GI symptoms your aim your game is to find the cause right is to find the cause of the symptom not just to de to detect the presence or absence of H. pylori. By looking for it, examining for it, testing for it, you're basically checking whether or not there is H. pylori. You're not actually checking whether, uh, what is the cause for the, for, the, for the abdominal pain. So the clear international recommendation from the international societies is not for test and treat strategy. No, you, you have to identify the cause and then investigate accordingly. So these guidelines produced by the SBGAN and the NSBGAN, which is the uh, uh, European and the North American Pediatric Societies of Gastroenterology. They got together, they produced guidelines early on in 2012, which has been recently updated and published in 2017. And over the next few minutes, I will just take you through the important parts of those, uh, of those uh, 
uh, recommendations, something which is you know evidence based uh, out of uh, respective societies, and we should really follow. It will guide our practice, and uh, and uh, it will make it evidence based. Perhaps one cannot, cannot really speak about H. pylori without referencing you know Barry Marshall, who was the uh, uh, yeah, the uh, describer of such uh, uh, infection and its association with gastritis, ulcer, and um, and gastric carcinoma, along with uh, his colleague um, uh, Dr. Warren, they were offered uh, the Nobel Prize for this for a different reason. Because I myself witnessed uh, the time when um, re recurrent or persistent peptic ulceration is treated with partial gastrostomy and vagotomy. When you can imagine the consequences to the time where this is now treated with. Ten, uh, two weeks course of antibiotics. You can just imagine, deserved, will deserve price, uh, will deserve Nobel Prize, really. So that is the H. pylori, yeah, you, you know, a spiral, spiral ketal, uh, with a lot of uh, 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 flagellus and various factors which will allow it to actually live in a hostile acidic environment. It digs itself in the mucus, lives in the mucus of the, uh, of the uh, intestinal lining. Uh, you know the flagelli and the adherence uh, uh, molecules on the on the capsule gives that gives it that kind of uh, facilities. But uh, um, I think the important facts to consider here is um, is uh, there are certain types of um, uh, this this organism. Um, certain genes are there, uh, and and uh, different uh, genetic structure makes it either very virulent or less virulent, carcinogenic or not also producing or not. Uh, here, I might actually just refer to uh, the uh, uh, cytotoxin-associated antigen, whether it is there, labeled as positive, oh, and, and it can be negative in such um, an organism. Positive, uh, or actually the presence of such an antigen is associated with virulence, with the likelihood of inducing uh, peptic ulcer disease and, uh, and malignancy of the, of the stomach, particularly the East Asian type, Japan, Korea, and uh, and uh, China, in comparison to the Western type, the gene uh, which promotes peptic ulcer and uh, and uh, 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 carcinoma stomach is also identified in these organisms. So um, there are there are varieties of it. There are different types of it which we have to consider and keep in mind. When you look into the stomach, that's what you see: very nodular, classical appearance. Uh, particularly on the tangential um, few nodular um, uh, antrum. And um, um, according to the distribution, it is classified whether it is antral predominant, where here results in a lot of gastrin production, then hypergastrinemia and a lot of acid production. This is associated more with ulcer disease. In comparison to the pangastric, pan pan the changes are there throughout the whole of the stomach or mainly in the body and the, and the, and the fungus. This tends to be associated with uh, uh, atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, and then the likelihood of developing into uh, adenocarcinoma uh, at a later uh, stage. This, this is what you see uh, under microscopy um, with hematoxin and anuocene staining. You see those kind of organisms embedded in the, uh, in the mucus of the uh, uh, gastric mucosa. Um, as I alluded earlier on, not exactly known, but it is again, you know, fecal oral or, or, or oral, oral, human to human, not known to be uh, among um, um, animals. So, when to test for it? Here are, here are the recommendations. Strong recommendation only if you suspect peptic ulcer disease. And when I say peptic ulcer disease, is actual actual ulcer or, or erosions, symptoms of those kind of pathological changes. If you think they are there, consider testing for uh, uh, H. pylori. If not, do not, like for example, in cases with functional or recurrent uh, uh, abdominal pain or uh, those with uh, no specific symptoms. So people looked at this and uh, you know, uh, uh, those who have got dyspeptic symptoms uh, and peptic ulcer uh, and uh, H. pylori in their, in their stomach, uh, they were treated, but there was no difference in comparison to those uh, not uh, uh, treated. Um, and again, you know, in the absence of ulcer, there is no usefulness on uh, in uh, in uh, treating it. Yes, there can be actually some association with uh, uh, non gastrointestinal manifestations. Um, known that um, 
uh, in unexplained refractory iron deficiency anemia, you have to consider uh, H. pylori for certain reasons. You know, H. pylori is, is thought to consume the iron while, while uh, it's, it's in the stomach, and by inducing hypochlorhydria, it may interfere with the, with, the, with the absorption of iron. So if anything else is looked at and excluded as a possible cause of iron deficiency anemia, consider testing for uh, H. pylori in infection. And that is the case also with chronic ITB for reasons which are not clear to me, but certainly not in simple straight away iron deficiency anemia or uh, short stature. And there are so many different tests available. Uh, the non-invasive ones, uh, you know, the serology, urea, the test, stool, the endoscopic ones are based on uh, rapid urea test, histology, cultures, as well as uh, uh, PCR. Uh, these are, most of them are actually sensitive and uh, specific, apart from the serology, do not do serology tests because it does not reflect the actual state. The antibodies can last for quite a long time. It may indicate previous infection from which the patient has actually uh, recovered. That is the case also for the serology of the, of the saliva. But the rest of them, I mean, we uh, often use stool antigens, is as sensitive as, uh, as, uh, and as specific as, you, as the urea uh, breath test, uh, similar to do, very stable uh, specimens, uh, and very comparable to the uh, urea, urea uh, breath test. The biopsies we get, we, we classically test it for the rapid urea test, and we do histology PCR testing as well, but not culture, not, not as a uh, routine really. So how to diagnose it once you think about it? It's actually by endoscopy and biopsy, not by anything else. You find it positive in the stool or by the birth hydrogen test that does not uh, uh, fulfill the necessary criteria. You still need to go and send the patient for endoscopy and biopsy. So the diagnosis is not actually based on the non-invasive tests. Unfortunately, it has to be uh, endoscopy and actually you take multiple uh, biopsies and we do uh, uh, the rapid reas and we send it for histology and sometimes the facilities as well um, if, if, if allows the, the PCR and you have to take multiple biopsies from the antrum from the body for uh, uh, histology and for, for PCR and uh, rapid ureas. So when to treat? Yes, when to treat? Yes, if the uh, uh, disease is discovered in association with, with peptic ulcer disease, for definite, that needs to be treated. You go in, you're investigated for, you, you know, uh, uh, some other um, complaints. You find the uh, H. pylori there. Whether to treat it or not, that can be, uh, you know, I mean, diagnosing it by, by, by endoscopy. That can be a matter of debate between you and the family, explaining the pros and cons of, 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 of each of the options. And as we said, iron deficiency anemia unexplained or chronic ITB uh, is also treatable by, by, uh, uh, by this. So the, um, there are, the sensitivity of the organism is variable from one place to the other, from one region to the other. The clear recommendation is actually every country and every region have to determine uh, the actual local and regional sensitivity of the organisms in the area by doing the necessary uh, research into this and also trying to find out the effectiveness of the first line therapy. Okay, it's very important to uh, explain to the family that they should adhere, finish and take all the medications for the necessary length of time, which is now two weeks because failure to do so out of the difficulty of taking, you know, three or four medications at the same time is a major factor behind failure to treat H. pylori. Basically, the regimes are made of a PPI or whatever, omeprazole or, or isomeprazole, amoxicillin, as we said early on, hardly ever there is any discovered ongoing resistance, but you can choose between ferrothromycin or metronidazole, depending on the local results of the sensitivity and depending on whether or not the child was tried on one of the medications or the, or the, or the other. So that is in short, you know, your triple therapy is PPI, amoxicillin, and uh, we will normally go for clarithromycin in our area here. That is what we agreed to do in, um, in our department at SKMC, that we maintain uh, PPI, amoxicillin, and uh, clarithromycin. Uh, we are embarking on uh, uh, finding out the efficiency of this uh, regime uh, and to work with, the, uh, with, with other colleagues in the, in the region. And for those who uh, failed the triple uh, amoxicillin-based therapy, 
uh, yeah, we go for the bismuth based quadruple therapy. These are the doses which you can find by referring to that uh, uh, paper. It's made easier based on the weight up to 25 kilo, then another 10 kilos, and then beyond that. Really made, 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 made much easier. The bismuth is to be given four times a day. One of the options is actually you, go, you, you give high dose amoxicillin um, if, uh, if needed, and if not, responsive to the initial ones. So yes, failure of, 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 of previous treatment, do not use the previous one, change it, or culture and, uh, and, uh, and uh, find the sensitivity if possible. Culturing it is not easy, not available locally as a routine, unfortunately. How to confirm the eradication? Eight weeks later, between six to eight weeks, we do a breath test or we do an, uh, a stool uh, antigen test, mata serology, make sure that it has been um, eradicated. Okay, and everything you do for testing for H. pylori, make sure that uh, the child is actually off BPIs for two weeks and off antibiotic for four weeks, because otherwise this might give you false negative or false, uh, false negative results. Allow a free time out of those medications before you test for it. Yes, levofloxacillin can be tried and uh, sequential therapy not anymore um, recommended really. Yes, there is a hope uh, in uh, uh, perhaps the development of uh, a vaccine. Chinese team has tried it with some efficiency of about almost uh, 70%. This is the summary of the recommendations. And perhaps I will stop here uh, to uh, go through uh, some of the uh, questions, if there is any.